Hello, Professor Lackner. Thank you for having us here today at the Neurotrauma Treatment Simulation Center. We are on the last day and it has been quite an experience. I have some questions for you, starting with, um, can you tell us a bit about yourself and your background and focus area? Uh, you're very welcome. I'm very happy that we were able to start with this first uh, Neurotrauma Simulation Center in Vienna, which so far is very interesting for me and there's been a big and a good community from all over the world coming to visit Vienna and to get in exchange with us and um, improve neurotrauma treatment all over the world. So concerning me, I'm uh, actually a neurologist, I'm a neurointensivist. Um, I have a big background in neurocritical care. Before I moved to Vienna, I was working at the Medical University in Innsbruck at the neurocritical care department, where we were responsible for uh, neurotrauma treatment. and. Now that I've moved to Vienna, I'm the head of the department of um, neurology here in Klinik Floridsdorf and also in Klinik Penzing. Klinik Floridsdorf is an acute neurology which is focusing on cerebrovascular diseases but also on mild and moderate TBI which we frequently take care of here in this hospital. And the Klinik Penzing is an um, early rehabilitation ward where patients with severe uh, neurological deficits like severe stroke, intracerebral bleeding and also traumatic brain injury are, are taken care after the acute setting in the early rehabilitation setting. So um, I'm in the lucky position to have uh, two departments where we are able to cover the whole chain of trauma care on the one hand the acute setting and on the other hand the early rehabilitation setting. All right, mm -hmm. thank you. And what motivated you to be part of the coordination team of this program? Um, actually, the idea of uh, performing a simulation center came up, um, I think, two years ago when we were talking about stroke simulation, actually. Um, I was talking with colleagues um, at an AMN meeting um, about our stroke simulation program we have instituted in the Clinic Floridsdorf because uh, we said we, we have to have stroke simulation to improve uh, our time from, from door to needle treatment or not, uh, door to needle time and so uh, we have set up a stroke simulation um, program here in the Clinic Floridsdorf and then um, the idea came up hey we can have it also for TBI and in TBI there are many treatment critical points for instance door to CT time or door to reversal of anticoagulation treatment and we thought that this would be a good chance to uh, have a simulation program set up and I discussed it with my colleagues here in Vienna and many of them said hey we have the similar um, uh, things in mind we we have many different other processes which we could improve if you simulate it and then all of a sudden colleagues from traumatology colleagues from neurosurgery from anesthesiology from rehab centers got on board and we were able to set up this for the first time this neurotrauma simulation center which we are very proud of it and hopefully um, also the participants will like it. Right, so it was truly a multidisciplinary approach. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, can you tell us a bit about how your experience uh, shaped your opinion on the management of neurotrauma? Actually, um, as I've already said, um, there are so many processes in the complex treatment of neurotrauma. Um, first of all, neurotrauma on itself is so complex, the pathophysiology of neurotrauma is so complex that you need a team, you need a big team to do the best for your patient. And this came into my mind um, already when I started with neurocritical care, that's over 20 years ago, when I first was there as a, as a, uh, a young doctor um, and I saw the complexity of, uh, uh, of, of the, the care chain uh, for uh, neurotrauma patients. Um, 
I realized that you have to be a team player. You have to have leaders, but you also have to have team players. And the neurotrauma chain of care is only as strong as the weakest part of it is. So we have to improve the weakest part of the chain, of, of the whole chain. And that is one of the reasons why I'm so enthusiastic to improve the multidisciplinary approach. All right, thank you. Um, are you familiar with any similar programs running at the moment? Not that I know of any similar programs. So there are similar programs in stroke, yes. but as far as I know, there is no other program comparable to this program in TBI. It's good. We yeah. are innovating the field. Hopefully, yeah. <laughs> If you have to identify three challenges in the approach of TBI, which mm -hmm. would come to mind? First of all, we need data. Um, if we do not have data, we do not know what our most prevalent problems are. And, we, and of course, if we perform any action to change um, any mode of action we are doing, so we don't know if we are successful. So first of all, we need data. And um, that's why we also in the AMN are so uh, um, enthusiastic and so hardworking for um, providing a new registry which is easy to manageable, which is easy manageable, which only takes short time and includes important quality indicators for the processes you have in TBI treatments. So I think we need data. And then we need to improve our collaboration. Um, of course, in many countries over the world, we are in lack of resources. We lack expensive structures. But in many parts of the world, we can improve what is existing there if we just improve our multidisciplinary collaboration. So the second thing is first thing data, second thing improve collaboration and third thing step wisely improve also of course the availability of structures of healthcare um, in the whole trauma chain. So not only in acute care of trauma, in preclinical care of trauma, but also in the clinical care of trauma and finally in the rehabilitation setting. So again, if we do not have the structures, we could start in improving the collaboration between the different chains of trauma care. So um, data, multidisciplinarity and collaboration and last but not least, improve structures. All right. Regarding the treatment and rehabilitation process for patients suffering from neurotrauma, which organizational issues do you think are the most pressing? Um, in the treatment process, what we could improve, I think, and have the most benefit out of it are actually treatment paths. Uh, to establish a pathway which should be our standard so we can stick to this pathway and we have standard operating procedures with which we can um, hand the patient from one organization or from one, uh, for one phase of the trauma care to the other, from preclinical to clinical, from clinical to outpatient care. So if we have a defined pathway which we can adhere to, I think we can improve a big, um, uh, we, we, we reach a big step in uh, improvement of trauma care. All right. From your point of view, which are the main limitations in the approach of cognitive, behavioral and depressive disorders related to neurotrauma cases? Mm, that we do not detect them. So um, I think the biggest drawback is we don't have a standard assessment of neurocognitive deficits. So um, if we do not diagnose them, how can we treat them? So first of all, we will have to set up um, defined protocols which we are sticking to and adhering to uh, to diagnose cognitive or um, neuropsychiatrical disorders and then we can think of how we can change the progress, uh, the process of um, um, 
aiding people or supporting people with the problems and even treating uh, those disorders. All right. Mm -hmm. Could you please describe to us one of the most intriguing, interesting or complicated neurotrauma cases uh, in your career? Most complicated neurotrauma cases. <laughs> one that you remember above all. <laughs> Any neurotrauma case is very, very complicated. So actually um, we once had, had a case where part of the brain prolapsed uh, out of the skull was a very young patient, I think he was 16. Um, with the combined effort of neurosurgeons, which were the main um, actors in the acute phase, and then afterwards the neurocritical care unit, and then afterwards um, the uh, uh, neuro rehabilitation phase. So imagine prolapsing part of the brain outside of the skull, and two years later, having a patient who was able to walk again. So, so my message is sometimes it takes long, but it's really worth the investment. Yeah. That is really impressive. Mm -hmm. um, online communities in the medical field are becoming more and more visible. What is your take on the importance of these communities for the advancement of the medicine and research? They are definitely the drivers of structural change. So our um, interdisciplinary and um, um, uh, international, the internationality, in my opinion, is very important because uh, each country can learn from each other. Um, is, on my opinion, and which shows us the history, the drivers of change in medical support and in the medical in the, in the way we think in medicine so uh, the um, uh, especially the AMN uh, being a very multidisciplinary um, uh, community is a very important driver of change in, in, in the field of TBI in my opinion All right mm. and um, what do you consider the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic mm. uh, was on neurotrauma management and on the caseload as well mm. On the caseload, we first had a decrease because we had these lockdowns all over the world. And if pe pe people stay at home, they experience less trauma, of course. Uh, then we had a increase back again. Um, so the last two years were really challenging for us because we were always competing for intensive care beds. Um, let's say if we have, have had the lockdown, we had more um, uh, COVID pa patients there and then after the lockdown COVID went down and neurotrauma went up again. So we had, I would say, a two years without any pause and that's the most dangerous, in my opinion, most dangerous and, 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 and um, challenging situation we are facing now, we are facing a human resource problem. We are really facing a human resource problem after two years of um, combined efforts. Mm -hmm. Many of our colleagues and uh, especially the nurses are uh, on the brick of uh, burnout. So we, have, we really have to take care of uh, our human resources in the hospital. All right. Thank mm -hmm. you. And the last question would be, what do you think are the main challenges or obstacles that would affect the proper long-term follow-up of the patients with neurotrauma? Mm -hmm. A proper long-term follow-up, again, um, it's lost to follow-up. So what the problem we have is um, as the um, treatment uh, phases of trauma at least include three, better four different phases, um, the communication between these phases um, is still non-existent in many countries worldwide, including Austria. So we will have to set up um, protocols where the data is collected in the different phases and where we can monitor the whole phase of trauma care in one patient and then again look at the quality indicators and learn from the process and learn from each individual patient and improve the process but only this will be possible in my opinion if we have the data on it. All right.
This was my last question. Thank mm -hmm. you very much, Professor Langner, for the interview. And thank you for having us here today. You're welcome. Thank you very much for coming. And have a nice afternoon thank and you. a nice weekend.